OK, so first about the question about the stability conditions on MGN bar, I was correct. There is a paper, a relatively recent one, by uh, Y.P. Lee and uh, a collaborator whose name is C.H.O.U. And it's exactly about Virasara constraints for varying the Hassett weights. So they consider some sets of, you have, if you have, because you have to consider all moduli spaces at once, you have to consider which Hassett space you're going to allow for all the points at once. And he has a, they have a notion for that. And then he, he writes down Virasara operators. He exactly writes down Virasara operators. So they exactly write down Virasara operators in that context. Uh, and as I said, that conceptually, in some sense, all of these things differ from MGN by some Gina zero behavior. So there are methods uh, to calculate descendants from one from the other. But to put them all together in Virasara constraints is done in this paper. Other people have studied the differences between the cotangent lines on these spaces. In fact, there's a paper by Alexeyev and someone some years ago. OK, so I hope that's enough information to find uh, the paper. If not, you can ask me. So uh, the last lecture ended uh, at this discussion of uh, sheaf counting in dimension 3 and the uh, geometry of the Hilbert scheme. And we went through the Hilbert scheme as a moduli space of ideal sheaves that was here. And uh, I noted we really consider all the bad points of the Hilbert scheme. Yeah. Eventually, you learn how to like these points because you spend most of your time working with what is considered the worst points in the Hilbert scheme. And the uh, work of Richard, where this, the obstruction theory is constructed and shown to give a virtual class. And then there was the observation that the dimensions of the virtual classes for the ideal sheaves and stable maps are the same in the sense that makes any sense at all. And where we exactly stopped last time was for this transition to Klabiyot threefolds. So I'll start here. So for Klabiyot threefolds, the, one of the nice things from our point of view here is both these moduli spaces, the stable maps and the ideal sheaves have uh, always have virtual dimension zero. And the very first question that you could ask here, although this is not the, how the subject developed, but nevertheless, is, is there a relationship between the curve counting by stable maps and curve counting uh, by these ideal sheaves? And so that's this question, is there a relationship? And let's look for how that might be. So the, first, the reason that you might think there's a relationship is that they both virtually count curves. That's true, uh, but there are some differences. I mean, the differences, for example, in this Hilbert scheme, you're counting all these little fat bubbles that are running around. But all, all the things you count are subschemes. For maps, for stable maps, there's no zero dimensional nonsense. But on the other hand, there are multiple covers. So somehow the moduli spaces look a little bit different. So it's hard to believe that there would be some equality on the level of moduli spaces, but still it's, it's, not, it's useful to consider the simplest hope. I mean, in general, it's good to think about the simplest hope first because you know, sometimes it's even true. So the simplest hope is that if I take some class that doesn't break, so an indecomposable class, like the class of a line on the quintic, for example, it's a line on the quintic. So it's a class that I can't break into smaller curve classes. But that way I don't have to worry about multiple covers. So if I take this indecomposable class, I might hope that the gromov witten invariant, which has genus G maps to this class, is the same as the ideal sheaf count, where I somehow um, try, to use, try to guess the Euler characteristic that this smooth genus G curve has. And that, I don't have to guess that. That's going to be 1 minus G. So one could hope for something like this. Um, and, one could and so we can, we can try to see how this could uh, be true or whether this is true. And the way that this subject has, has developed is that the, there's an example which uh, uh, is the first example to, to study more or less for all questions. And that is the uh, example of a P1 with normal bundle minus 1 minus 1. So I take this P1 in the Calabi R threefold and has normal bundle minus 1 minus 1. This is somehow, so it's a smooth P1. And one imagines this is some, somehow generic rational curve, the Calabi R threefold. 
So this is in some sense kind of like a thought experiment. We just we just imagine that our Calabi R threefold has one. Of course, there exists Calabi th threefolds where these exist. And I want to consider what this uh, what this curve contributes to this gromov witten invariant. And there are techniques about how to do those calculations. And this calculation is a kind of old calculation, maybe even a little bit before 2000. But anyway, it gives the answer. It gives the contribution to the genus G gromov witten invariant of the ambient Calabi R threefold in the class of this P1, this rigid P1. And it's not a completely trivial thing. This, this, although it looks like it's only a genus zero curve, it contributes to the gromov witten invariant in all genera. And that's because you can map higher genus curves to this P1 by contracting higher genus bubbles. So you can map, you can map a higher genus curve to this P1 by taking, this is the domain of the curve as being a P1, and then the, the, the curve could have some tails of high genus that are mapped to points. So it looks silly, but uh, nevertheless, in the stable maps, this, this innocent rigid rational curve actually contributes to the gromov witten theory in all genera. And moreover, those contributions can be calculated exactly, and it's given by this uh, trigonometric series. And we put it in this generating function where we keep track of the genus. I put the u variable for the genus. This is the genus variable. Genus. Though it's the only thing moving in the sum. The curve class is fixed. The Calabi yau is fixed. So the only thing moving is the genus, and I put a genus variable. And if you do this, you get this very nice formula, the trigonometric series. And you could ask, how are these integrals computed? And that was a, there was a time when there was a lot of work on how to do those things. And the idea here is you can move everything to actually moduli space of maps to P1. That's not surprising because we're talking about those maps where the curve gets to the quintic by first going through this nice P1. So we can reduce the entire calculation to P1. And then there's new techniques there, this localization of the virtual class, and then how to deal with what are called these Hodge integrals. And then on top of that, a bunch of tricks. And integration is just like in high school, you're never guaranteed to be able to do an integral. And often there's some tricks involved. So this is, this is some kind of direction, which I'm not going to really investigate in this lecture. But uh, that's kind of fun. And you know, at that time, we were doing a lot of these integrals and it really felt like first year calculus in the sense that there's all these integrals and you have to learn all the tricks, and in the end, you get trigonometric functions. Okay, so uh, so anyway, that gives the left-hand side. That gives, if we want to compare, in this very simplest example, it, it gives the answer for this side. That's kind of good news. It gives the answer exactly for this side. So if we had an answer for the ideal sheaf, the DT side, if we had an answer, then we could try to see whether they're equal. Okay, so then we have to go study this DT calculation. And this is done in these papers, MNOP one and two. So that's Devesh, Malik, Nikita Nekrasov, Andrea Konkov, and myself. And we wrote two papers, and that was a long time ago by now. I don't know the dates, 2000 plus something, maybe 2005, something like that, six, I don't know. But uh, we do the calculations on the DT side, and uh, that uses, in some sense, some of the same ideas. So there's localization, but now on the DT space, which is, which is the Hilbert scheme of, of points, sorry, Hilbert scheme of curves. And of course, there's lots of points. And the Hodge integral uh, are replaced now by box counting ideas. And uh, Andrei Okunkov, also with Reshetikin, had developed some box, box counting techniques, which are very useful in this context. And then, of course, there's also lots of tricks there. If you look at those papers, there's various tricks about how to handle this. As I said, that you're, I mean, integration in some sense is always some kind of summation and you're not guaranteed to, get a, to, to be able to get a closed form answer unless you're working on a nice problem. So anyway, it turns out this problem is a nice problem. And now we fix this curve class just as we did before. And now we look at all the ideal sheaves. So this was the, this is the DT invariant. In, invariant. And the moving thing now is the Euler characteristic. Can we give it, also give it its own variable and call it Q? And uh, I should have remarked on this, it's a small remark here is that this is the genus and a genus of a connected curve starts at zero and goes up to infinity. So this is a sum for zero, one, two, three, so on. But this is a stranger thing because 
in, in DT theory, we fix some curve class and we're supposed to sum over all of the possible uh, Euler characteristics. So if you remember that from yesterday, that was a while ago, yesterday. So I just remind you what's going on here. Where's the, oh yeah, so here, this is the moduli space of uh, curves if I view as the Hilbert scheme, whose class is beta and whose holomorphic Euler characteristic is N. I must write that somewhere. Yeah, here, Hilbert scheme of curves and N is the holomorphic Euler characteristic of this quotient curve, of the curve itself. And beta is the, um, beta is the class of the curve. But it's not the case that this starts at zero or starts anywhere really in particular. You know, if you have a genus G curve, it's holomorphic Euler characteristic is typically negative, it's one minus G. So you don't really know where this sum starts. You have to sum over all possible uh, holomorphic Euler characteristics in this sum here. You have to sum over all possible holomorphic Euler characteristics and you don't know, so to speak, when it starts. Of course, in any particular case, you might investigate. Like in this case, it's not so hard to see that this number starts at one, but in, in general, you don't know. And normally one writes this sum as this N and Z because it really could be negative. And, uh, but the thing that's true by geometry is that it's uh, zero for sufficiently negative. So it's always a Laurent series. Anyway, one has to execute the sum and by a different, I said a different kind of set toolbox of tricks, you can calculate this exactly. And this is the answer and you get something that, uh, um, well, you get something very simple here. Uh, that's a rather simple function of Q. Uh, and you get something, uh, you get something that um, is more complicated. Which you get the McMahon function. The McMahon function is this infinite product here. And this McMahon function is, is related to box counting. Uh, in the, and it's related to lots of things. It's, it's related to box counting. Actually, McMahon apparently uh, found this function, had the idea to start thinking about this function because he was stacking cannonballs in the British Army. So it's kind of uh, some kind of military spin-off, actually. It's, uh... And the th another thing that it's not so surprising if you think about it is not only does this McMahon function occur, but it occurs to the Euler characteristic, to a power, which is Euler characteristic of the Clabiau threefold. In particular, the answer here has to do with the whole geometry of the Clabiau threefold. The answer here had no Calabria threefold in it at all, because as I said, that the whole problem is, can be reduced to, to studying the geometry of that rational curve. Things far away in the Calabria don't matter. But for the DT calculation, they do matter. And it's obvious why they matter, because if you take ideal sheaves, even if you're interested in uh, the ideal sheaves that are, uh, are have to do with this curve, you can have these little fat points running around everywhere. So that's the nature of the answer. And then if you look at these formulas, so that now we have both sides exactly solved. And if you look at these formulas, in very particular cases, you could hope for, you, you, you get some things like this, but in general, if you try to match these invariants by this series to uh, these invariants by this series, you will not find uh, any matches at all. So the, I, the, the conclusion about a simple literal hope fails. The, the moduli spaces don't match, they're, they're too different that way. Uh, but a more sophisticated hope actually has, is much more encouraging. And that says that, okay, let's actually just see what the answers are. So we can start with the DT answer, which we've calculated. So we start with the DT answer. And this, this crazy McMahon function is obviously not, we're not going to see that again. So let's just divide, by, divide out by it. So I, I've taken it, I divide out by the McMahon function by multiplying it with the negative. So, it's gone now and I get this little series. I mean, I guess, sorry, I get this little rational function. That's a pretty nice little rational function. And then if I have the idea to make the substitution, the substitution here is I have Q is equal to E to the um, minus IU. And if I'm going to make any connection between these two series, at some point I'm gonna to have to confront the fact this is in U and this is in Q. And so at some point I have to confront in some sense change of variables. And so one has this idea of having this change of variables and if you plug this in, it's a small high school exercise to plug this change of variables into this function. And then you get some kind of uh, series. And then you have to use the formula for sine. And if you do this patiently, you find that it's just exactly correct. So I say that again. So if I take this uh, DT series, I take out the McMahon part, I get, a I get this rational function and I substitute 
this rational function in, in exactly using this substitution. And this, this substitution does turn rational functions into trigonometric functions. And if you find out what exact trigonometric function it turns to, as I said, you can do this very patiently. I, I did it here, probably it's even correct. <laughs> the, uh, you exactly get the gromov witten series. The, this, you end in this, fair, this formula that Carol Faber and I had found. So that's very promising. And if you're very optimistic, you can just, just gen, you can make a, con, uh, a sweeping general conjecture based on just that example. And that's what we did. That's this gromov witten DT correspondence in this MNOP in the first paper of MNOP. And the, the conjecture said qualitatively says that the relationship found for this minus one minus one curve over P1, this local geometry, rigid rational curve holds in general. That's the conceptional way to say it. And we had more examples than this minus one minus one curve. Uh, there were a lot of things going on at that time. And there's this topological vertex, which allowed to do, allowed um, the calculation of toric calabiaus. And you could see that there, that's related to box counting. And the, the vertex was developed by Aganagic, Clem, Mourinho, and Vafa. And there's box counting methods that were developed by Andrea Kunkov and Rashtikin. So there were a lot of tools there and we could do more examples than this one. And we found this relationship was true there, but nevertheless, that's, the, that's somehow the origin of this conjecture. And I, now I want to write it down precisely. So, it, but in, in some sense, this is already the full content of it, but let's try to write it precisely in full generality. So let X be a Calabia threefold. It can be anyone you want. So by this, I mean non-singular projective Calabia threefold. And then this has a gromov witten series, a gromov witten potential, F. And it's a sum over all the genera, over all the curve classes, not zero. We don't want constant maps. So these are non-constant maps. There's a whole discussion about this at the separate discussion. Um, it is enlightening to think about the constant maps, but I don't want to have that as a distraction at the moment. So I sum over all, all genera, all non-constant maps, I put the gromov witten invariant, and then I have a variable for the genus. That's the same variable we had in this example. And then I need some way to keep track of the classes. And so this is normally put in some kind of Novikov ring or anything, but we can be kind of naive about it. It's, it's a variable that, uh, uh, that keeps track of the curve class. And this is, uh, this prime here was some, some terminology that was used. I'm not sure it's good terminology, but anyway. It's to remind you that we've taken out the constant maps. And then I can take the exponential of it. Exponential means that I start with connected theory, then it's a disconnected theory. Taking the exponential is quite important because in the didn't, it didn't show up in this example. So when I said that uh, the relationship found here holds in general, it's maybe a slight lie that that's the only thing here. But what, one of the things that doesn't show up in this example is that all the curves in this example are irreducible. In gromov witten theory, the way with for connected curves, the uh, support would always be connected, but in the sheaf theory, it can be any support. So there should be um, some disconnected version of gromov witten theory. And that's of course, just taking the exponential. So this is the connected version of gromov witten theory. I take the exponential, I get the disconnected version. And if I do that, I get uh, uh, a disconnected gromov witten theory. That's a series in U for every curve class beta. It's just calculating the disconnected uh, gromov witten invariance in that curve class beta. On the DT side, uh, we sum over all beta, including zero now, because we'll remove it by hand. And we sum over all N, and then there's the DT invariance, and now the variable Q, and this, the curve variable is the same. And we can write it this way, where that's the contribution of the uh, curve class beta part. And the, the first conjecture has to do with the constants, the constants in DT. In DT, yeah, so this is the, um, the geometrically, it's a little different. In gromov witten theory, we can just throw out the constant maps because the moduli space is fine without them because there is a connected moduli space, a connected maps. In DT theory, we can't just throw them out. We'd be, we'd be very happy to do that. And we're going to do that later, but that's a different theory of stable pairs. But if you have a Hilbert scheme, the Hilbert scheme's general points looks like this, right? I mean, I, I drew this fuzzy thing and you could say, I don't like these guys. I don't want them. I want a Hilbert scheme that just looks like curves. And you, know, you can't do that with the Hilbert scheme. It's not a legal move. It will lead you to some problems. 
we have a question in the chat. Yeah. Is there some solution for why exponentiating gives a disconnected chromo witten theory? What's the reason for that? If there is some intuition. Uh, yeah, that's just what it does. Like, for example, um, if you want to count, if I take a, a, a if I take a Gromov Witten variant one in a line class, when I exponentiate that, what happens is that uh, yeah, I mean, so the exponential turns connected to disconnected and kind of in big generality. And um, am I am I can I can I try to I mean I can explain one 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 aspect of that, but it's good to think about it. In some sense, it's very simple combinatorics. But suppose I have some geometry where I have one line, and that's my connected invariant. When I take the exponential of this series, this one line will be a, a one times this uh, variable, which keeps track of the curve class to the line. And when I take the exponential of that, what's that going to do? That's going to somehow contribute. Uh, what does exponential do? It'll contribute some, that, that particular term, when I raise it to the exponential, It'll have some series where I take m times the line, and that one will stay here, and it'll be divisible by m factorial. All right, this is what will happen in the exponential side. And what is the what is the meaning of this? It means that I can look at a map that's not just one line, but m lines mapping to my one line, and then this map has an automorphism of m, fact, of m factorial, and that's why it's here. So this is just one little piece of why this works, but the reason why uh, exponentiating uh, gives you disconnected is uh, um, more or less just a matter of the combinatorics of the of what the exponential map does. So I invite you to think about that, or maybe maybe that can be discussed in the problem session, also. But anyway, when I'm here, I in the DT side you don't have the option of removing these uh, these fat points by hand, by geometry. Actually, you do, but that's a different space. But in the Hilbert scheme, you don't have that option. And so in order to confront it, we have to calculate those in every case. So the, the easiest conjecture at MNOP, there's three conjectures. The very first one says that you take any Calabio threefold and you look at the, the uh, degree zero DT theory. That's a DT theory of the Hilbert scheme of points of that Calabia threefold. That's some kind of new thing. It's uh, some virtual class on the Hilbert scheme of points of Calabia threefold. And the first conjecture is the answer for it. It's this McMahon series to the Euler characteristic of X. And this was the first one that was proven. There's now there's many proofs of it. There's a proof by Jun Lee, there's a proof by Baron Fantecchi, and there's a proof also using cobordism methods that I gave with Mark Levine. So that's the most modest of the conjectures, but it's required. And then the next thing for the DT theory is we want to remove these points. And so we remove it from the level of generating functions by dividing the DT generating function by the DT zero one. So that's the idea is just to remove the constant contributions on the level of uh, generating functions. Then I make this, then I have a, a DT series that's kind, kind of a reduced DT theory series without the, I interpret it as a, a DT series without the constant, without the fat points. And now the next conjecture, which uh, is kind of important also, is that the DT invariants then are always the Laurent expansion of a rational function Q. That's exactly what we saw in this example. If we go back to the example, we take this, this is the raw DT series, then we remove the point contributions that's getting rid of this, and you get a, a rational function in Q. So the conjecture is this always happens every single time, that uh, once you remove the point contributions, the this DT series is the Laurent expansion of rational function in Q. And moreover, it's a very special rational function in Q. It's invariant under Q goes to one over Q. This was maybe not something you checked when you saw this, but uh, perhaps you should have. So you look at this function and you substitute Q goes to one over Q, you find amazing and you get the same function. It's a very special kind of rational function that satisfies this functional equation. And so we conjecture that happens every single time. And that's conjecture two. And this turns out this conjecture is also accessible. And it's accessible by methods that when we formulated the conjecture weren't there, but came into the subject very soon, which was uh, using ideas of wall crossing and as proven by Bridgeland and Toda. So that's kind of an extremely nice proof. And it shows that it, it proves that this is a Laurent expansion of a rational function for Clavier threefolds. 
So maybe I should just write here because you can talk about this more in general for Calabia threes. It proves, so their, their work proves that it is a Laurent extension rational function more of it satisfies this uh, functional equation. So those are those two conjectures are proven. And then the, the conjecture, um, the more, most complicated conjecture is the one that's the relationship with the chromo witten theory. And it says, step three says, once you've done that, once you know this is a rational function, then I can do this uh, uh, substitution. The substitution on the level of power series is very slightly illegal because it starts with one or minus one. On the left-hand side, this starts with minus one. And if you substitute power series when, with a minus one, then you're confronted with issues like convergence and things like that and, and analytic continuation. And we don't want to do that and we don't have to. Since this is a rational function, since by this, by this state in the conjectural uh, discussion, and it's actually proven now, since this is a rational function, such a substitution is always legal. You can always substitute into rational function and then you get a series in U and then the claim is that that's exactly the series. So that's the gromov witten DT correspondence. Uh, and in this level, and the way I've explained it, it's a very clean statement. And it's a really, if you think about this, if you have, if you have not thought about these things before, uh, it's entirely real, it's in some sense and can be entirely grounded in a careful understanding of this one, one small piece of geometry. Uh, okay, did I wanna say something more? Oh yeah, what's the status of this? I would say it's open. I mean, many cases we don't know, but it's proven also in very many cases. So all the clavier toric geometries, this was proven in the uh, first pass that's the other O here is Oblomkov. I'll write the names later. So this is, so for, for toric geometries, it was proven for complete intersections. I proved an argument with, with Aaron Pixton. And also this argument, Aaron Pixton basically shows that if you have a Calabia threefold with a, a good sequence of degenerations to toric varieties, we can also prove it in that context. Uh, so it's, it's proven for a lot of familiar Calabia threefolds, but I don't know how, if you wanna say, is it proof for every single one? This is not the case. All right, so that's the, now I finished yesterday's lecture and I'm going to go on to today's lecture. So maybe it's a good time to ask a question if you want to. Yeah, is the microphone on? Yeah, yeah, could I, uh, is there some geometric significance of this uh, substitution or is it just the thing that works to match them up? I mean, you know, when we were playing with it, it wasn't really some I have a question because it is a, um, yeah, I mean, it was kind of obvious when we were playing with these things that uh, it's the, it is the thing that changes the box counting problems into the Hodge integrals. And it was kind of understood that, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know how to actually answer that question. Maybe the way, if you're, if you're going to, if you want to pose the question in the following way, which I encourage is that how would you find this uh, substitution without doing any calculation? Um, I don't really fully know how to answer that. So I don't know how to do it by pure thought. But on the other hand, there were lots of examples. We were calculating things all the time there. And, and one, one knew, for example, that the Hodge integrals that come up when you substitute this way, you get rational functions and the box counting also gave rational functions. I mean, maybe there's a question of the sign. The sign is not really, you know, for the qualitative stuff, the sign's not really that relevant. In some sense, the sign has to do with some ways that, I mean, what are the pluses and minuses in the DT theory, for example. But I, I think that if I'm honest, I'll tell you that I, I don't know how to justify this uh, uh, substitution without doing any examples. I mean, people try to make up, make up some stories and you know, maybe there are good stories, but I, I don't know how to say anything in, in a completely rigorous way. But on the other hand, the example is pretty simple. All right, so I have to find now the next file. I think we're on D now. Hmm. 
So this is part D. You can find them on, well, the same links that Andre sent before. Okay. So are we back in business now? Can you see? Yes. Yes. Okay. So. Okay. So th that's the that was the basics of this Grimm Witten DT correspondence. And as I said, there's a lot of ways to go with that, but I'm going in the descendant, in the direction of the descendants. So somehow that was the the link that's put all of these lectures together. So we're going to go to descendants. I hope you like descendants because uh, we've had a lot. <laughs> have more. So descendants for curves and sheaves. So we have discussed descendants for the moduli space of stable maps. And I want to re revisit that construction um, in a slightly more abstract way. I don't know if it's more abstract or not, but it's slightly from a different perspective, from the perspective of correspondence. So I want to, to define this, uh, this symbol, this tau k gamma that we saw inside the brackets in the gromov witten series, the gromov witten uh, invariants. I want to define uh, this symbol now as a particular cohomology class on a particular moduli space, and specifically a cohomology class exactly at this uh, grading in this moduli space. So there's no genus index. So I mean, it's you'd, you'd consider all the, and there's no beta index. So this fellow is a uh, cohomology class in all of these moduli spaces at once. So k will be as before the power of the cotangent line, and uh, this delta tells you where the cohomology class gamma started in X. And the idea is to use this correspondence. So this is a, a basic uh, strategy that if I have the moduli space of genus G curves, I can take the curves with one mark point, which is like the universal curve over the left-hand corner. And that has an evaluation map that's evaluating the map at that mark point to X. And it has a projection map to uh, the underlying curve. Well, the underlying map without the mark point. So this, in this way, this top space, the one-pointed space, uh, provides a correspondence between the target and the moduli space. And when, when I have this correspondence, then I can, uh, I can use it to, to move a cohomology class from X to uh, the moduli space. And that's what I do. I pull it back, and then I push it forward. But in, while it's you know, in the... Uh, in the transit in this transit stage, I am allowed also to apply some cohomology classes here, and I apply the uh, cotangent line to the kth power. So this is the this is the definition of this descendant now realized as a, as a certain cohomology class, and it comes by uh, using this correspondence to move the cohomology class that, that you start with gamma. You move it first up here, and then you multiply with the descendant with, with the cotangent line, and then you push it down. And if you do this, uh, if you keep track of the bookkeeping, you'll find it lives here. Okay. Uh, and the, the nice thing about looking at it this way is that uh, formally the same things happen, the same constructions can be pursued for the moduli space of sheaves. So what is a typical moduli space of sheaf? It has some, uh, that's the moduli space. I'm calling it I because we're gonna eventually use it for the ideal sheaves or anyway. And then over the moduli space, there's the moduli space cross X, there's a universal sheaf. And then I have two projections onto X into the moduli space. And if I start with some class, cohomology class on X, and if I want to move it to the moduli space, then I can use this correspondence. I can pull the class back to the product. And then while I'm uh, in transit there, I can apply uh, churn characters. I mean, you can pick whatever characteristic classes or however you want to organize it, but a straightforward thing to do is take the turn characters of this universal sheaf and then push it down. And then I've, if the module, if the target variety or the variety in question is dimension R, I'll shift the turn character by a little bit to make sure that I have the same dimension rule that I used for gromov witten theory. You don't have to do this. But this is now a descendant in sheaf theory. If I have a moduli, if I have a moduli space of sheaves, that's a, you know really respectable moduli space. So it has a, a universal sheaf over the product with the, with the space in question. Whenever I have that, I can use this construction to get descendants uh, in the theory of sheaves, and I get some tautological cohomology classes in the moduli space of sheaves. And this is not a new idea, it's an old idea. So examples, like the really classical example is when X is a non-singular projective curve. So when this R is equal to one, that's the classical example. If I pick a line bundle, 
this is just to, well, you don't have to do this, but if I pick a line bundle, then there's this space, the moduli space of rank two stable bundles with fixed determinant L. So that's a space that's been studied a lot. And if I pick the, determ the degree of L to be one, then there'll be no semi-stables. This is a very nice moduli space, a nice smooth moduli space. And I can define descendants exactly using the strategy that I take that moduli space of rank two bundles, I have some universal sheaf, I can pull back cohomology, use the churn character of that universal sheaf and move them down. And, uh, and a theorem that's relevant to this is that actually the full cohomology of the moduli space of rank two bundles of fixed determinant is generated by such descendant classes. And you have to use, in this case, X is the curve. The curve has also odd cohomology. So you have to use this descendants of the odd cohomology here too. And this is a, a results by Mumford, Kerwan, Zaghi, and also a, 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 there's also a related investigation of the relations. And also you can change two to higher rank. And so there's, there's a whole chapter of algebraic geometry related to this. From our point of view, it's, it's, uh, it shows that this descendant construction is pretty useful construction. It gives everything in that case. You, I mean, you don't expect every time to get gives everything, but it gives everything. In the example of the surfaces we considered, that was exactly a parallel construction that was used. I mean, it's, it's used also to define the Donaldson invariance. Often it's called the slant product there. And when I explain various computations for the quote scheme, the insertions I put are churn characters of this tautological sheaf. And this is very close to descendants. In fact, if you look at that, if you look at the dimension of this, this is churn, these were churn classes after push forward by growth and decrease on rock. They're related to churn classes before push forward. So if you use growth and decrease on rock, you can exactly change this into the descendants of this lecture. Anyway, so my, all I'm arguing here is that this descendant construction for moduli space achieves and some kind of general universal construction that has already been used many times and more or less is very useful. And that's exactly parallel to our descendant you know, from the point of view of correspondences, these the descendants in uh, the moduli of curves. Okay, so, um, so now we go back to our threefolds. And, and the idea here is that we're already happy with the gromov witten DT correspondence for Calabiao threefolds but we want to promote that whole theory to descendants. And if we do that, of course, we can't just be satisfied with Calabiaos because Calabiaos have dimension zero. So when we start with insertions, we'd like to have some curve, we want to consider some threefolds X with some curve class beta such that the virtual dimension, which is, is positive, so we can consider these. But anyway, the gromov witten theory allows us to create some descendant integrals using the, the descendants I've described in this lecture. I warn you, these are very slightly different from the descendants that, from the previous lecture with the brackets, because those were defined using the markings and there's a little difference here. And since we're, I'm only discussing this matter here a bit formally, I'm not gonna worry about that difference. Uh, but anyway, there's, there's a gromov witten theory has some descendant theory and the DT theory of ideal sheaves also have the descendants. And with the ideal sheaves, it's perfect. The Hilbert scheme has a universal sheaf over it. And I can just off the shelf use the definition for descendants for sheaf theory. And I get the, this notion of descendants there. So the question here is that since we somehow know what to do for the gromov witten DT correspondence in the Klabiao case where there's no descendants, it's just somehow an integral is one on both sides. In the Klabiao case, we're just integrating one here on the moduli space and also a one on the ideal sheaves. So we know exactly what to do here. That's the gromov witten DT correspondence. And as I said, it's proven sometimes, not proven other times, but we're pretty confident that that thing holds. That's really stable ground. But now the question is, can we lift this to deal with all descendant insertions? And the, if you believe that, it's kind of like believing that correspondence, whatever the reason that correspondence, whatever reason that that correspondence held, that reason should somehow propagate to these kind of parallel correspondence constructions. And that's a pretty serious leap and it didn't have to, doesn't have to be true. I think that's fair to say. So the, here's the question. Can we extend this gromov witten DT correspondence of M MNOP to descendants? And this was already considered some first steps of this was, was taken in the second paper, MNOP2. We wrote two papers where there's some ideas about this. And okay, so 
So now, in order to make progress on this, one can continue with the ideal sheaves, but it turns out it's not the best idea. That, uh, and the symptom of that, the early symptom of that was in the case, the Kalabiao case, which, as I said, we're supposed to be completely happy with now, at least on the conceptual level. There was something that was a little unpleasant on the DT side, which was that there were these fat points running around and we had to remove them by hand. Um, not in the geometry, but the level of the generating functions. And it turns out that when we consider these descendants, and maybe I could say it was a little bit lucky we were able to do that. Uh, but when we start considering these descendants, uh, we'll see that it becomes harder and harder to do it. And at the end, it poses some uh, serious difficulties. So what happens now is we switch horses a bit that uh, in the world of sheaves, there's many, many different moduli spaces. And this can be viewed in some sense as stability conditions, choices of stability conditions. That's probably the best way to think about it. Uh, so we're going to switch now. And uh, I talked about the ideal sheaves first for, I mean, for two reasons. One is because that's actually how the subject started. And the second reason is that um, most algebra, at least people on the algebraic side, algebraic geometry side, have an idea of the Hilbert scheme. That's kind of part of the standard uh, repertoire of uh, knowledge in algebraic geometry. So that's, why, that's the reason I started it. But in fact, nowadays in the discussion of the theory, almost all the discussion is, is not about the ideal sheaves. It's about the, the moduli space of stable pairs. If we're discussing these sheaves supported on curves and threefolds. And, and the stable pair is more or less repair the shortcoming of the ideal sheaves, which is to say, they give a geometric way to excise these points to get rid of them. That's somehow the one line sentence about why it's good. But after doing that, it turns out they're better behaved in, in, in basically every way. And the development of uh, both ca the calculation side and the theoretical side has more or less all switched to stable pairs because it just, they're just better. But of course they have, you have to pay a little bit to start. The definition is not uh, as well known as ideal sheaves. So I have to tell you what it is. So let X be a non-singular projective threefold and the discrete invariants are gonna be the same as for the ideal sheaves. I pick a, I pick a curve class and I pick an Euler characteristic N and this P for pairs, P N X beta is the moduli space of stable pairs. This moduli space has two things. That's why it's a pair. It has a sheaf and it has a section. And this F is a pure sheaf of dimension one. So what this means is it's a sheaf on X. So here's X. I'll, there's a nice picture in the next uh, slide. But anyway, as a warm up here is X and this F is a sheaf on it. So that means it could have support up to dimension three because X is dimension three, but we, we ask for has pure, it's a pure sheaf of dimension one. So dimension one means that its support is dimension one. Pure means that its support is pure of dimension one or more even fancier. It means that every subsheaf has a support of dimension one. Maybe that's a better way to say it. So that's what F is. And uh, what is S? S is just simply a section of F, but it's not any section of F. It's a section with co-kernel of dimension zero. That means it's a section that it can't, the section can't be the zero section. It's a section that's a co-kernel dimension zero. So that's it. And so in some sense, the definition is not so bad. It's the multi space of stable pairs is these sheaves, the sheaves are pure dimension one and you pick a section and the section can't be stupid basically. The picture of it is this, that's the picture. This is a picture that basically everybody has in their head when they think about stable pairs is here's X. Now this, the stable pair, the F is this black sheaf that I've drawn and I've kind of tried to draw its fibers. Its support is this green curve and the picture you should have in your mind, the kind of the ideal picture, the ideal element of this moduli space is this, the support is a nice smooth curve. Of course it doesn't have to be, but that's the ideal picture. And the sheaf is, an, is a pure sheaf on a smooth curve. So, um, it's nicest, uh, the nicest picture for that is it's just a line bundle. So you're picking F as a line bundle on your smooth curve and you have to pick a section. And the section can't be zero. So that's my section, it's like zero. It can't be identically zero. So it's zero at a couple of points. 
and you know, in algebraic geometry, if you have a section of a line bundle on a smooth curve, the line bundle, both the section and the line bundle up to some C star are actually just determined by the zeros. So the data of the stable pair is incredibly simple to think about. It's this green curve with the uh, divisor. But those are all the, only the ideal elements of it. I mean, the, the, the best behaved elements of it. The moduli space has degenerations. You can have pure sheaves that are more complicated. They're not line bundles on their support. And uh, the sections could be zero at the singularities of those sheaves, so it can be more complicated. So the construction of the space can be, you can just look at, there's a, a book by Le Potier who studied, uh, before we were thinking about DT theory, et cetera, that he, he studied uh, constructions of uh, moduli spaces of uh, uh, sheaves with sections, et cetera, and stability conditions. And it turns out that it's precisely this definition of a stable pair, his, his theory already covers the construction of it. So you can look at his book. This, the references are in some paper in, in some papers I wrote, I wrote with Richard Thomas. So the construction's already there. It's, a, it's more or less, uh, it, so one doesn't have to do, develop a, a new theory to construct it. They've already been constructed. And it is a scheme like the Hilbert scheme. And somehow, you know, the, the, the having this section uh, takes out the automorphisms, rigidifies it. So it's a pretty nice space. That's uh, this guy. So this guy should say this is a scheme. It's a fine moduli space. It's a scheme. It's very much like the, the Hilbert scheme. I mean, this moduli space of pairs and the Hilbert schemes are kind of cousins. So the, the, the uh, somehow first classical example is when X is P3. That's a th threefold. And inside this moduli space of pairs is the classical locus. This is just my terminology, the classical locus. And that pr parameterizes these ideal objects I said. And those ideal objects are non-singular irreducible curves of degree D, these kind of space curves together with a line bundle and a section. And there has to be some, uh, and then there's somehow some linear relation that tells you what the holomorphic Euler characteristic is. But roughly speaking, to, to be in this classical locus of stable pairs on P3, it's just the data of a line bundle on a smooth space curve with a section. So as I said, you can also think about it as just a smooth space curve with some, with some points, because that points determine the line bundle and the section. So the, that's kind of nice, meaning that somehow the idea of what the bulk of the space is is simple from the point of view of geometry. The interesting part about the space, of course, is what else is there in the space. And it's always the case with these moduli spaces that while one likes to imagine the general object, which is incredibly nice, in fact, all of the study and the analysis in any case is always on the most degenerate objects. That's just how life works. Okay, so although I'm skipping all the analysis of the degenerate objects, I'm telling you that actually all the, all the thought is about those. So the first thing we need to get started is we need an obstruction theory. And this one is a, a significantly more subtle than the Hilbert scheme. And the reason is that in order to get the right deformation theory, one has to view this pair. Well, you can view this pair as a map from OX to F because I have a sheaf and I have a section that is a map from OX to F. But you have to view this, uh, this as a complex in the derived category. And the deformation theory, the, the deformation obstruction theory that we place on this uh, stable pair space is as a deformation of objects in the derived category. And so one has to prove that this stuff makes sense. And this is explained in, in that first paper with Richard. I have the title down somewhere. So that's a that's pretty technical, uh, subtle discussion. But it turns out that you can define a deformation obstruction theory on the space of stable pairs, where the, the deformation space is given by traceless x to 1, where a 
of the stable pair with itself, except viewed as an object in, in the derived category. And the obstruction space is x2, and the higher x vanished by before. So in some sense, it's very similar, but things are, it's very similar to the Hilbert scheme, but things are slightly more complicated, and one has to take slightly different perspectives. OK, but after that's all done, you have a nice uh, virtual fundamental class on the space of the exact same dimension that one we've already seen twice before. And uh, yeah, here's the paper. The first paper is the counting curves via stable pairs with Richard. OK, and then what about descendants? Well, we have these descendants also. This universal, the stable, uh, the sp modular space of stable pairs has a universal sheaf, which is the universal uh, sheaf in the stable pair. It also has a universal section, the universal sheaf. And then we have maps, we have the same correspondence before, and we can define descendants exactly before. It turns out it's smarter to do something else. It doesn't change much, but it's smarter to not take the, just the churn class of F, but to take the churn class of, um, well, you, because the complex stable pair not only has a universal sheaf, but has a universal complex with a universal section. And it's a little smarter to take the churn character not of the sheaf, but of the complex. And why I, I say it's only a little bit smarter is because this is after all the trivial bundle. So it's not gonna change much, but it'll change a little bit in one place and that will help you. So we define this uh, churn character, the, we define the descendants and we call it instead of the tau CHK. So that's the descendant insertion and it's given by the churn character of this complex. Okay, so that was a little uh, detour to get us up to the same level in stable pairs as we had achieved in, uh, in the DT theory of uh, ideal sheets. And, and now, now the question is, why did we do it? I tried, I tried to give you some example. I, I tried to give some motivation. It is the case since the stable pairs by definition are pure of dimension one, they're supported on curves. There's none of this nonsense of these fat points running around. That's just not there. And you could say, well, how, how did we make that profit without any payment? And the answer is, of course, there is some payment. You had to pick the section. The, the um, Hilbert scheme has just a subcurve. It doesn't have the sheaf with the section. So there, that's the payment. You get rid of the running around fat points, but you have a little more complicated structure on the curve. There is a place where they kind of overlap. You could say the Hilbert scheme, what's on that curve is actually O of that curve. That's the sheaf and the section is one. And that's, a, that's the place where the two ideas overlap. Okay, maybe if you haven't thought about those things, you can think a little bit. But anyway, that's the, roughly the, the uh, transaction there that you get rid of the fat points, but you, the price of that is to put the sheaf with a section but the overall transaction is a profit because everything's happening then on the curve. And one of the consequences of that, I mean, the first place where you see that's a real advantage is the study for descendants on stable pairs. And um, that's what the end of this lecture, which we're getting close to and tomorrow is about, it's about this descendant theory of stable pairs. And there's a kind of a circle of ideas here. The first is to promote the, core, the GWDT correspondence to, to the case of the descendant theory of stable pairs. And there's various papers, some even quite recent. And in that, as I said, that we had on the, in the Gromov witten DT in the first pass, rationality of the series played a serious role. And so one of the, one of the parts of this wheel is rationality of the descendant theory of stable pairs. I wanted to still say a little bit about that today, which I will. And uh, then somehow the most interesting piece of this puzzle is the Virasara constraints, which is to say that if you believe, and here this should be now a uh, clear goal in the sense that if we believe that the descendant theory, theory of Grom, the descendant Grom of Witten theory it corresponds to the descendant theory of stable pairs on a threefold, since we already know there's Virasara constraints on the Grom of Witten theory, theory, there must be a way then to find these Virasar constraints on the stable pairs theory. And that's correct. And I will explain that and even prove it in some cases. So there's a, uh, I tried to write here some, well, these three basic ideas and then some of the papers that are relevant. And then there's even some, uh, 
key here. One O is Andre and two O's is Oblomkov and Okonkov. Okay, uh, maybe they're all two O's here. No, there's one O there. All right, so the last topic today before we, it's, it's the, so tomorrow will be about the Zverisara constraints on the stable pair side. That's kind of, in some sense, uh, a lot of open questions in that direction, but I want to start with the rationality. And the rationality statement says that if I stay, if I take my non-singular projective threefold and I can define this descendant generating series. So there's nothing has happened here now that we haven't already seen. And this is the descendant generating series, I should say four stable pairs, just so it's clear. Four stable pairs. And it's defined by this bracket. The bracket tells you what the space is, what the curve class is, and then what are the uh, descendant insertions, these churn characters given by, those are given by those correspondences. And the left hand, so the, the left hand side is defined by the equality, the qualities we sum over all Euler characteristics, holomorphic Euler characteristics in this way. And then we take this integral of these descendant operators on the uh, fundamental class of stable pairs. So this is now completely well-defined. We've discussed every aspect of this definition, I think. And that's a series in Q. And we get lots of them because you get to choose which cohomology classes you put in here and you get to choose which numbers of the turn characters, there's lots of them. You get to choose your turn class, you get to choose this. And of course you also get to choose your space. And it's important that this is a, this series is a um, Laurent series that, that doesn't go infinitely negative. That's the very basic aspect of it. And that's because the moduli spaces, they're just physically empty for N less. You don't, you don't need to know anything to show that these, that you get zeros for very negative numbers. They're just empty. Well, you need to know a little bit of classical geometry to prove that, but it's empty. So then the, the first rationality conjecture, which is an incredibly clean statement, it says that this series as defined is always in every single case, the Laurent expansion of the rational function in Q. And uh, if you want to see an example of it, there's a paper I wrote on descendants of stable pairs for this Donaldson volume. Can you see that? It's a little small. Not really, no, it's uh... Can you see it better now? It's a little fuzzy. You see that it, is, and it has like 10 terms in the numerator and- yeah, 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 you don't have to know too much about it, but just, you know, th this, th this is a show, there's some complexity here. So this is an example of degree two with a tau nine. Um, so maybe the, the notation has changed here, but don't worry about this too much. For P3, it's a, for uh, twice a line. It's kind of, kind of complicated series. But if you see it, it's rational. Technically, this, is, this, technically this computer program outputs a conjecture, but uh, it's 100% certainly correct. That's not the issue. I'm just trying to be honest. I, we can discuss why that's true later, but if you want. But uh, if you look at it, it's, there's something kind of remarkable about it. It's not a random rational function. First of all, the bottom has some roots. Those roots are uh, you know, not complicated roots. They're plus minus one. In fact, they're all roots of unity. And the top is a very far from random thing. It's palindromic, if you see it. There's a 73 here and the 73 and the minus 825 and minus. So it's in, it has this entire palindromic symmetry. So that's kind of a striking thing. And uh, that's of course formulated in the second part of the rationality conjecture. And that's related to, that's by the way, that's related to Q goes to one over Q that we saw for gromov witten DT correspondence. So the second part of the rationality conjecture, which is formulated with Aaron is that this rational function is very special. So if I look at this rational function, it only has poles at, at roots of unity and zero. Actually, this was something we, what already goes back, I think into MNOP2. But the part that's uh, precise, was formulated precisely later is it satisfies this functional equation that if I take this, whatever rational function I get here, and if I substitute one over Q, uh, it satisfies this functional equation and the terms of the functional equation depend a little bit on uh, what's being uh, submitted here, the Ks. And also the degree, uh, the, this uh, size of the first, the virtual dimension here. So those are the two uh, rationality conjectures. The first just says it's rational and the second says, actually it's a very special type of rational function. I mean, you can look at this thing, it's extremely special type of rational function. 
And there's, a, there's ways to calculate it. We could calculate this rigorously, but that takes longer. And it's not so clear what the point is. But oh, um, Alexei, so Alexei has uh, some computer programs that allow you to calculate the answer, but not rigorously because the computers, you know, they're not that smart. Okay, so then the last thing I wanna say is that this is great for uh, stable pairs. And if you believe this, you should be convinced that if you wanna think about descendants for sheaf theories, you should work on stable pairs because they have this beautiful rationality property uh, in every case, at least conjecturally. But what about ideal sheaves? What happens to them? And, and here is the one of the reasons why we don't want to carry them along in the descendant study. Although that's an interesting thing to do, but maybe the right way to say it's harder to carry them along. And that's because they fail to be rational. So it's not true that every function in the world is rational. And if you do the same construction for the ideal sheaves in the Hilbert scheme, you define the same descendants and the same series, the same descendant series. And I put an I to show it's the ideal sheaves now. Then of course, you know it's not rational because the first one is McMahon series and that's not rational. But that's not the problem because we, we knew how to fix that. So what the idea, the first idea was you take this descendant series in the DT theory and you divide out by McMahon because you know McMahon's an irrationality that we've already dealt with. So we divide that out. So this is our, this is basically the best hope and the DT on, on the ideal sheaf side. And the problem, the first problem is this is still not rational in Q. Um, you know, maybe this is not such a serious problem, but it makes it the subject harder to develop in that line. And the whole source of this irrationality is those fat points. And if you want an interesting mathematical conjecture to prove there, is that uh, with uh, Alexei and Andre, we conjecture that while this thing can be irrational, and it definitely can, that's not, uh, that's not an issue. It can be irrational. This normalized series is a polynomial. So it has rationality in it, but it has all of these other functions. These are the, this uh, QDQ, this iterated derivative of a special function F3, and that's, an, that's the F3, which kind of looks like the Eisenstein series, except the Eisenstein series have odd powers here. This is even power. So this is so we, this conjecture says precisely exactly how much more there is in these kind of functions and rational functions. We don't know how to prove this conjecture. Um, and maybe I stop with this comment that for some years, we would call this the Frankenstein series because it's very close to Eisenstein series, but doesn't have any good properties. But then people in the subject said that this was irreverent in some way, so we don't do that anymore. So whatever this thing is, whatever the name of it, it's not the Frankenstein series. Okay. So Rahul, we have a couple of questions in the chat, but before I want to say that the summation should go over n ideas. So oh yeah, sorry, I, I screwed that up. Okay. So <laughs> okay. there are questions in the chat. Uh, there's one which is, which actually pertains to what we heard before. How do you understand the fact that in many concrete examples of Calabia threefolds, we can, in some sense, interpolate from the stable pair moduli into the Hilbert scheme moduli via wall crossing? Is there a conceptual explanation for this interpolation? Yeah, you can, I mean, uh, conceptual, I don't know, but I mean, you can formulate it as, I, I would say more generally, you can formulate it as a, I mean, you know, it has to do with what you, uh, yeah, I don't know how to answer this question exactly. Uh, yeah, in, in terms of um, stability conditions in the drive category, you can view the Hilbert scheme as uh, the result of one of the stability conditions and you can view uh, the uh, stable pairs as a result of another stability condition and that wall crossing. So I think that Richard wrote some paper where he explains that very carefully. And so these ideas, they, they also have different, yeah, I don't. I don't know how to say something somehow really much more about that, but they are, they are view, you can view them as different, uh, uh, the results of uh, what you view as a stability condition. So in so, some sense, it's a question whether you ask for this section to be, you know, how much weight you wanna put on the section. And one of them, you ask the section to be surjective and that, uh, that gives you the Hilbert scheme. But if you loosen it to being surjective, then you get the, uh, um, then you get the stable pairs. Because it, you know, one of them is really just a, 
if you write it like that, one of them is O going to OC. Let's say one of them is O going to F with a surge action. The other is O going to F. And this is not surjective. And when, when it's not surjective, then you have to pay some price for it. And that's why you get the other conditions in the stability. Another question we have, maybe you can go to Alexei's uh, rational function. Because the, the question is, what are the roots of the, of the palindromic polynomial? Oh, that I don't know. I don't know what that is. I mean, they're going to be, they don't have to, it doesn't have to factor over Q. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, so I, a, I guess the question is if there's a meaning behind the, you know, the complex numbers you get or whatever. I don't know what the meaning is. The, the roots and roots of unity, we have some kind of control over which roots of unity uh, occur. And roughly speaking, the roots of unity that occur are related to how, how multiple the class is. Like in this case, for example, you get only, uh, well, you get minus one whose square is one. And that, that two has to do with the fact that this is a, a two here. Okay. Um, but this that's the, that stuff's conjectural I, you know I don't know how to prove yeah even this statement that this this functional equation is always true yeah maybe I should have said that that this rationality conjecture has been proven in some context so it's going to be very important that we've proven it in all of the case, all the toric cases when x is toric this rationality conjecture is proven if it's a uh, one leg toric then I think we have control of the functional equation it's possible. But in the general toric case, I don't think we have control of the functional equation. So this part is still a little bit mysterious. But it's really striking when you do the examples. They, they turn out to be this, these beautiful palindromic uh, polynomials. And, and I should say that I did say that in the case of the Calabi-Yau, that uh, there the functional equation is proven. The Q goes to one over Q. And how is that proven there? Why is it proven there? It's because there's a different technique in Klabia, which is not really being covered in these lectures at all, which is uh, this uh, as developed by Kai to use some kind of weighted Euler characteristic to get the Klabia invariance. And uh, the one Q goes to one over Q is proven using some properties of that or the characteristic, that weighted Euler characteristic together with some ser duality that, that relates um, higher coefficients to lower coefficients. So there's a very nice geometric reason why, well, I don't know what happened to Alexis' function. There's a very nice geometric reason in the Calabi-Yau case why we get these uh, palindromic uh, polynomials. And actually it turns out that whether it's palindromic or anti-palindromic depends on the sign here, but, uh, but that, those arguments don't work in general. They're, those arguments only work in the Calabi-Yau case. In the case like in P3, we just have no argument in, in, in the full generality. So I think we have time for one more question. Uh, are there any series that you would expect to be rational in the DT4 case? Oh uh, yeah, the people are working on that. I don't know who asked that question, but my advice is to ask uh, Young Han. I mean, people are working on those DT4 calculations. And I think that it's, uh, uh, the first hope would be some kind of rationality if you, but you know, the, the DT4, here we have one curve class and we have only one other parameter. In DT4, we have two other parameters, but uh, so I mean, some of the people, I mean, some of the people in my group who are there who are working on that is Young Han. I think Wunan is also thinking about it. So I would uh, address those questions to those two. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>